Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I invite you to please come together with me and pray. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you that you have drawn us together this day to hear your word. May you guide our hearts and guide our minds that as we consider all that the world puts before us, that we may see those as your gifts to us. Lord, we pray that we would always hold you steadfast, hold hold to our faith and never let go, trusting in you for your mercy, your grace, and your forgiveness. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Abercrombie and Fitch, American Eagle, Sony, Panasonic, Lincoln, Mercury, Ford, Cadillac, stuff. Things, all those are brand names that you probably have heard, that you maybe have seen on TV, that you have seen the advertisements for. All those things are stuff. Stuff that we're pretty comfortable with. Stuff that we like to collect, like we, that we like to have. Some people, we call them hoarders, collect a little bit too much of this stuff. But most of us just like to collect some of this stuff. Many of us like to have a decent car to drive, house to live, and clothing to wear. And honestly, there's nothing wrong with stuff. In, fa- in truth, stuff is actually neither evil nor good. In fact, a person could have a bunch of stuff and be a faithful Christian. A person could have very little and not love God. See, when we talk about stuff, it's a very technical term here, we realize that it is not merely about the items that we own or that we have, but it is more about where our heart is. In fact, if you will go with me, I'd encourage you to turn to Luke 16. And right at the end of Luke 16 there, we have verse 13, one that kind of is a familiar verse. You may not have it all memorized, but you probably know the very end of it. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It seems like a fairly simple command to us. You cannot serve both God and money. How many of us would serve money? How many of us would bow down before money? We would not do that. That is not something that even crosses our mind. But what we have to do is look at this text from the perspective of the rest, verses 1 through 12 as well. When we look at that text, we realize the focus is dealing with our desires. The focus is dealing with where our heart is. That last word that that the ESV translates money, I think is much better translated mammon. And not so much from the Greek mamanos, but more so the, the Hebrew, which translates amen. Not amen, amen. Which basically means faithfulness and trust. So the root word for mammon actually is faithfulness and trust. And when we look at that root word, we realize exactly what Jesus is getting at in our text for today. He is focusing on the fact that so often we put our faith and our trust in things that will fail. So often we put our faith and trust in things that will break, that moth and rust will destroy. But you know that. You're the people of God, right? You know about what it means for the world to be out there. We're in here inside the church, right? So we can't be infected by the same worldliness, right? Or not. Because when we look at the text, we realize that it's not merely about the things that we have. It's not merely about the items that we own, but truly it does get back to our entire focus. When we talk about worldliness, it may not have anything to do with goods, but it might be the focus that we have on taking care of our families, something that is a godly practice until we put them before God. It could refer to taking care of our health. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. We are meant to take care of our health unless we put it before God. It could be considering our popularity, considering our standing, considering where we are among others. Certainly, we should avoid offense if we can, although God's, the, Jesus says the gospel does offend at times. It could be unwilling to confront the worldliness that is around us. And I think more often than not, more than the objects in our lives is that unwillingness for us to confront the worldliness around us. We might talk about it. We might consider it. We might even say what needs to be done. But how many of us are going out there and confronting worldliness? 
How many of us are going out there and confronting this attitude that ignores God? In our world today, there is a turn from God towards self. It is not a worship of money, a worship of things, but a worship of self. And I think that is the infection that is going through our culture and our society today. Because what we see is the devil working in the hearts of people, including good Christian people, and leading them to focus on me, what I want, what I need, instead of God's design, God's plan, and God's desires. And when we look at the text for today, and we look at Ecclesiastes, we see the words of Solomon and we hear those words and we realize that all these things, even ourselves, are going to pass away. These are hard texts to look at, aren't they? We can face fears and we can face temptation. We want to get rid of those things. But it's harder to face worldliness, isn't it? Because so often we've gotten used to what we might call creature comforts. We've gotten used to those things which... We enjoy. Now, being a godly person doesn't mean that you can't enjoy some of those creature comforts. But it is where we prioritize those things. It is where our desires lie. It is where we truly put our trust. And it has, a, has, a, it has bearing not only on, the, on when we confront worldliness in our hearts, but when we confront worldliness around us and where we start we start with the con confronting it in our hearts the worldliness that we desire the worldliness we have we first have to confront that coming before the Lord and seeking his repentance coming before the Lord and hearing his words I forgive you those words that we hear were not easy and cheap words those words that we hear were not free words free to us but they had a great cost. It was the Christ who gave everything so that we might hear those words, I forgive you. It was Christ who gave all so that we might know His love for us. There was nothing cheap about that. It was Christ who humbled Himself, even though He is God, taking on human flesh. It is Christ who went to the cross for us, whose hands were pounded into the tree that we might be able to be free. And when we repent to the Lord, when we come before Him, He offers us that forgiveness because of what Christ has done for us. He offers us that forgiveness no matter how often we have trusted in the world and focused on the world. He again offers those words of forgiveness. But He, he is pointing us to a greater truth and a greater desire, a greater hope. Not the hopes of this world, the empty hopes and the broken hopes of this world, but rather the hope of eternal life. When we focus on the cross, when we focus, when we take our focus off of this world, we see that God's plan is greater. That God's plan is for us to have true life and eternal life. The things that we have, how often do we replace them? Clothing that we wear, the, gar the, the cars that we drive, the houses that we have, the we replace those things so quickly, reminding us of how short-term they last. But God's love is eternal. See, before the foundations of the earth, God had already set into place your salvation. He had already set into place the salvation for each and every one of us. And that is what truly confronts worldliness. That is how we truly face worldliness, is telling people the truth. Instead of letting the, our society continue to lead people away, instead of letting our society, our worldliness, continue to, to get in the way, it is telling people the truth that God loves them, that God forgives them, that God hears, hears all those prayers of those people who are broken by sin, of those people who are lost. But so many of them don't know so many of those people are caught up in the world. They think that all that is about is the money, the goods, the clothing, the popularity. And those empty promises leave them empty in their hearts. And God gives us that opportunity to fill their hearts. Not filling it with who we are, but filling it with the Word of God, the Word of forgiveness and the Word of salvation. 
God picks us, His children, to share that good news, to confront worldliness around us. And yes, it means more than talking about it. It means more than being the people of God right here, but it means the people of God being right here and going out to the people who do not know God. It means confronting the world in a very real way. Now, St. Paul, he gives us a little instruction in this department. He tells us to go ahead and to, do, to share the love of God, to do so not in a mean, beat-them-over-the-head type of way, but to do so as God has shown us His love. And time and again, we're going to be unsuccessful. I'm going to warn you of that now. Time and again, when we con confront the world, we're going to discover that the world doesn't want to hear our message, that they are comfortable with where they're at. But that's where St. Paul's words really speak to us. Fight the good fight, people of God. Fight the good fight of faith. Confront the world where we're at. Confront the world in your heart. Confront the world so that the world might know the promise of salvation. So that the world might know that Jesus Christ, our Savior, died on the cross for them. And only then, only then will we change the world. When we confront the world, when we stop talking about it but confront it, only then will we see the changes in our children, in our families, in our communities. And we've got to go. We've got to go and face the world, confronting it, changing it, so that all may know the promise of truth, so that all may know the hope, the hope that we have that gives us the power, the, need, the, the strength to fight the good fight of faith. May God's Holy Spirit guide us, direct us, lead us, and empower us to face worldliness and to change the world. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we do give thanks to You for the many good things You give us. We ask, O oh Lord, for Your forgiveness in those times when we've been caught up in the things of this world, in the times when we have been fearful to share the good news. Lord, may You empower our hearts to go forth and to proclaim Your Gospel message. Lead us and direct us that we might go and share the good news to those in our family, to those who are our friends, to those who are in our communities, so they too may know the promise that we have the promise of salvation that wells up within us and that we cannot help but share with others. Lord, help us to remember each day that it is nothing in this world that can separate us from You. That nothing in this world can separate us from Your gracious love. For Your love is greater. May we have the promise and the hope that one day we will be with You in, e in paradise. Until that day, Lord, guide our steps and guide our ways. Let us face this world fighting your good fight. Amen.